We're going to start talking about shell code. And I think we'll do lunch like at 12, like 12 to 1. How's this on there, really? And I want to uh, get through a basic example of shell code advisement. And then you guys are going to have a lab where you actually develop your own shell code. And then I want to get up to that point, uh, introduce the lab to you by the time we eat for lunch. That way, if any of you feel especially motivated, you can um, you know, have a shorter lunch and work on that over your uh, lunch break. So that'll be one of the trickier labs, I think. So, what it was cool that we exploited this cool login program. We got it to you know run the Go shell function even though we gave it a bogus password. However, it was kind of lame in that we were relying on this uh, pre-existing Go shell function to do our bidding. Um, and that's not exactly arbitrary code execution. Remember I said at the beginning of the class our goals are always arbitrary code execution. That isn't exactly arbitrary because you know we're relying on this uh, pre-existing code that we didn't design ourselves. We want to be able to call the program to do anything, to uh, open up calc.exe or um, you know, find a shell to a port or something like that. And uh, the process of doing that is shell code. Essentially what shell code is is a small mini program that you inject into the input of another program and you uh, redirect you know, EIP once you gain control to that mini program with the shell code that you've developed. And that mini program will do whatever you want. So um, examples of real shell code is something that does like uh, you know spawning a shell. That's real shell code. If you're looking at a local Linux exploit, it'll spawn a shell and root process, and it'll have root on the box. Or in the Windows world, it might uh, go to a prefixed web address and download and execute a file there. Most commonly, it's a rootkit or something like that. Um, or it'll bind a shell to a port, and then the attacker can connect to that port and then issue commands if that's like a remote exploit. Um, what you usually see in like an enterprise scenario when you have firewall set up, you can't, just spawning a shell doesn't do anything because um, the attacker has no interface to that shell, and just finding a shell doesn't do anything because normally the enterprise is behind a firewall. So um, common like enterprise attack shell code is something that will go up and like go to a fixed web address and download an next download and execute an executable, and the attacker will of course some rootkit on some hijacked website, and then the shellcode will go and download and execute that shellcode. Or you also see something like connect back shellcode, which is your the mini program, the shellcode will connect to a prefixed address, some compromised server, and uh, listen to whatever that server tells it to do, and it'll start reading it you know, commands and executing those commands. And that will sort of bypass the firewall because you're going out somewhere. Uh, so that's just a couple uh, examples of real-world shellcode. Um, our first example is going to be Hello World shellcode, because that's the first example for all kinds of programming. But of course, there'll be a different spin on uh, Hello World, because we'll have to be one of these mini programs, these shellcodes, and that uh, makes it a little bit more challenging than your normal Hello World style program. Okay. So let's talk about some properties of shellcode before we even try to develop some of our own. Um, first of all, it has usually has to be pretty small. Um, for instance, programs, even ones to print Hello World, are usually pretty big. You know, if you were to like uh, look at the size of a Hello World executable in Windows or something really simple, uh, that's another trivial program. It would be huge. It'd be like four kilobytes, right? And that is. Uh, not that is bad as a disadvantage for the shell code because let's assume we're overflowing something like the uh, the password buffer. That this was only 64 bytes long. So essentially, what that means is that our shell code would have to be less than uh, 64 bytes. Okay, and so 64 bytes is pretty small when we're talking about uh, you know code that you develop. So you always want to make your shell code as small as possible. Um, position independent. Usually, when you have a program like Hello World, you'll be passing an address to a function like printf. And so, like printf address, and that address will be the uh, address of the Hello World string. So, this is a little example to show you guys. If I was to click and write some program, dumb.c Oops. 
Jews. So this is just Hello World, basically. And um, you know, see that I just hacked up real quick. And we can see the call to printf is uh, basically just pushing this address to printf. And uh, stored in this address is basically the, uh, the hello string. You can verify that. So, yeah, pushing the address in the string to printf. And this program would not work as shellcode because in this case, they're assuming the, um, the hello string is located at this address. like a fixed address, you know? And so if this was a mini program, a shellcode that we injected into a, another process, this address would basically be bogus in the, um, the victim process address space. So it would try to print this address, and in the victim process, the process that we're hacking, this address would point to something totally different than hello. In fact, it probably wouldn't be an ASCII string anymore. It would like crash the program or something like that. So. Um, your program can't really contain any absolute addresses like this. So when I say position independent, I mean like does not contain any absolute hard coded addresses like this. So there's uh, another constraint we have to work around, which can be a little bit tricky sometimes. <coughs> and just to um, verify my point, see there we go. I just compiled a. Yeah, the Hello World program is like 8 kilobytes, so something really stupid, and there's no way it's going to fit to a 64 byte buffer. So we're going to have to handcraft everything and assembly, yes, assembly program. That way we can work around all these constraints because the compiler is, doesn't normally have to deal with these constraints, so you usually just have to do all this stuff by hand. I just have a basic assembly question. Yeah, sure. So when printf is called, yeah. how, what, what is how does it know to use that uh, EAX as the parameter? Is it because you pushed it to the stack? It's on the stack, yeah. The x86 and the calling conventions can vary. Um, they're mostly the same in x86. There's a few different calling conventions, but the most common one is that you just push the parameters to the function on the stack or you call them. And printf knows I expect one or two or three parameters, so I'm going to look at one or two or three values on the stack before I was calling. But it has to be the most recent thing on the stack yes. when you call. Yeah. So um, we'll actually talk a little bit more about arguments and that sort of thing once we get into competing depth and you have to speed stack because we'll have to understand that a little bit better. That's uh, day two stuff. Okay. So just sort of uh, having you guys visualize the issues we're going to run into with shell coding here. Full screen. Um, Here's another kind of tricky one. It should not contain any null characters. Anyone know why that is? So if we're overflowing what's interpreted as like an ASCII buffer, a string buffer, like a password buffer, if there is a null character in our shell code, um, when the program, the victim program, is reading in our payload, our shell code, and it sees that null character, it's going to say, OK, I'm done reading stuff in. And only half of your payload is going to be copied, or up until when you hit that null character, because null characters uh, signify the end of the string. Everyone got that? A little bit tricky. A lot of times, especially in uh, Windows exploits, or uh, ex vulnerabilities you'll find in Windows, um, will be in like binary protocols where you're not overflowing ASCII data uh, or string data. It's just more like a, you know any sort of arbitrary binary data and you don't have that sort of null character constraints. But just to make your life harder, build character. I'm going to say no null characters because in this class we're generally overflowing uh, string buffers so we can't have um, this bad null character. Um, this last point is kind of the same as the uh, position independent which is basically to say we can't have any hard-coded absolute addresses in our, in our shell code because they're probably going to end up being bogus in the, uh, the victim process address space that our mini program is injected into. Okay, 
So what I hinted to that, to basically get around all these constraints, generally you have to handcraft uh, all of your assembly code, if not large portions of it. Um, you know, write it by hand in assembly, so that is exactly what we're going to do. Luckily for you, we're doing this in Linux and not in Windows, because assembly and internal shell coding in um, Windows is a lot more ugly than in Linux. So Linux is actually pretty nice, because uh, Linux assembly program is pretty clean and straightforward. Um, so first of all, before we can talk about writing shell code in Linux, let's just talk about writing assembly in Linux. Out of curiosity, has anyone uh, written Linux assembly code before? Okay, so it's a no big deal. So, um, in Linux, hopefully you all have seen at least, you have these things called system calls, which are just like powerful system functions which do things like create a file, delete a file, open a socket, um, you know, general system functions. So, like, write, for instance, is a system call. You know, these are just basic general functions that the operating system provides. They're kind of like the core functions that everything else is built on top of. Um, and accessing these in Linux and with Linux assembly is actually pretty easy, which is what we're going to do. For, um, for our Hello World example, we're essentially going to uh, program assembly to call the write function and then write a, uh, the Hello World message, so write some buffer containing Hello World to standard output, which is just one and um, you know, the size of the message. So we basically just have to call that function from assembly. And that's, uh, that's not too bad. Because Linux has this handy dandy convention where each system function, each system call is assigned a number. So write is assigned like the one and create file is like two and delete file is like three and uh, read is like four because they're wrong. But, you know, each one is assigned a, a unique number basically. And then the call system call you basically set up the register so that EAX, first register, contains the other number associated with the system call. EBX contains the first argument. ECX contains the third argument. EDX contains the, uh, the third argument, and so on. And then once you have all the registers set up with the correct values, if you interrupt OX80, the operating system will intercept that and say, OK, I detected that this program wants to execute a system call. Uh, I assume the registers are set up correctly, and I'm going to use those registers, EAX or whatever, to, uh, to perform the system call. So it's really pretty simple. Okay, so um, yeah, I should point that out. So these numbers I was mentioning, you know, I said that each system call has a uh, unique number associated with it, and you can actually find out where these are, are by looking at this file. Uh, slash user slash include ASM I386 blah 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 that H. I'll bring that up right now. I mean I've got to tell you what all the system call numbers are in this class, but in case you want to see any other ones. Is that a standard convention in all Linux system calls that arguments are in the order of the are placed in the order of registers? Yeah, you can see it. Um, that is for system calls only, not for functions. Yeah. Uh, Standard libc functions pass the arguments on the stack, like I was showing you before the push, but in system calls, you uh, pass the arguments by register. So it's just different because you're calling different things. Uh, you know, you're not just calling a general libc function, you're actually telling the operating system to perform some all powerful function, and it's the operating system has to handle that, so it just has to be done a little bit different. Um, if you want to learn more about why that is, Probably take a, I think the video talks about that in his intermediate class. Um, oh, no. I already forgot the name of that file. Can someone tell me what that app was again? Like ASN, ASN. I386, is that right? Yeah. And then, and then. Yeah, so all the unique numbers are there. So you can see that the read is, you know, three. So if I wanted to call the read system call, um, I need to set EAX to 3 if I wanted to call write, which is what we want to call to write our message to standard output. Um, EAX has to be 4, open, close, create, unlink, which is like delete file, blah, 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 blah. You can see all the awesome functions that Linux lets us call. And you can call any of these from assembly that you want. Let's say I want to call the, um, the fork system call. 
I can see EAX needs to be 2 because that's the number. Then I would do man fork for the manual page for fork. And um, oh, this one's pretty simple because it doesn't have any arguments at all. So I would just have to hit set EAX equal to 2 or whatever, whatever it was. And then do um, interrupt OSA. Yeah, question? Bob, some of those are privileged though, right? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, you're not going to be able to do anything you want based on what your user privileges are in the system. But it would be up to the operating system to make that determination. You could try. You could like set up a system call and do it, and the operating system would basically just say no. It's going to set EAX equal to like negative one to let your program know that uh, you did not execute the system call successful. So um, that was actually kind of a bad example since there were no arguments. Uh, let me choose another one. So exit, that one's easy. So exit is system call number one. And uh, it just has one argument, which is the status. So exit zero means like there was no, the program executed successfully, or exit negative one meant it terminated the problem. So if I wanted to call this as a system call, I would say EAX equal to one, and EBX equal to whatever status bit I wanted to exit with. And then I would do the uh, interrupt to what PD command, which I will show you. Yeah. So here's Hello World. Uh, let me. I suggest you guys follow along with your hand copy the slides since, like, you know, pointed out some of this text is a little bit hard to read. Um, so in this case. I create a data section where I store the owned message. Okay, that's what we're printing to the screen. And I'm going to call the write system call just to help myself. I sort of took the manual page entry and put it out here. Uh, if I remember, recall correctly, write is number four for the system call, so I said EAX equal to four. Um, set EBX equal to one, the file descriptor equal to one, just so one equals standard output, basically. And um, set the this parameter equal to the uh, the message, the pointer to our screen, and then edx equals eight, which is just the length of this screen. And then once I do interrupt ox80, the operating system intercepts that interrupt and says, okay, the program wants to uh, execute a system call. I assume the registers are set up. I see he wants to do a uh, write system call. Those are the things, so I perform it. And um, there it is. You get hello on on the screen. So. Just to make sure we can all compile and link this stuff uh, correctly, let's all compile and link uh, the basic Hello World shellcode, or the basic Hello World programs in the shellcode unit. So these are more commands that you're going to want to write down, by the way. So first off, all of these files for the Hello shellcode can be found in the student home directory. So, uh, and then the Hello shellcode directory, so if you do hello cd, hello underscore shellcode, <coughs> You'll see all the files are in there. The one we're dealing with right now is hello1.asm, which just contains what I showed you on the slide. And then to compile and link this thing, uh, write these commands down just so you guys know. Uh, NASM, which is the netwide assembler, dash F for format, L, which is the, um, the Linux executable format. And then you also have to link the program. So yeah, I would just add that to your list of uh, helpful commands. NASM, LD, and yeah, there you go. So there you go. Uh, you know, Linux assembly isn't all that bad. It's actually pretty nice. Uh, once you get into the Windows world, things get pretty hairy. And if you take uh, exploits two, you'll see why, basically. So I'll just give you guys all a minute to uh, make sure you can compile and run that. So, you know, 
no surprise there, it's a simple program easy to compile and run. And uh, the Hello World program at this point is not suitable as shell code, even though we've handcrafted it in assembly because there are some issues that I'll point out. So first off, let's start uh, looking at this as shell code and trying to convert it into something we can inject into another process and then point the return address at. Okay, here's another uh, another command for you guys to, to know. And it's obj dump dash d hello one, which basically means object dump does all kinds of fun stuff on uh, Linux executables, and d is just a symbol. Hello one is what I named you know, our, our hello world, our compiled hello world executable. And this just will show me the program bytes for our um, hello world program and uh, what they actually correspond to in x86 assembly. So we can see that move 4 and the EAX, by the way, this is in uh, AT&T syntax, not uh, Intel syntax, just be aware of that. But basically, you know, move 4 to EAX. This corresponds to these opcodes, you know, processor opcodes. Move one is this. Uh, interrupt OX80 is these. So here you go. Um, we want to con convert this into shell code, something we can inject into the password buffer and then return into that. So um, we haven't really uh, tried to make this shell code yet, but you can go ahead and tell me. Um, one thing you may see wrong with this that uh, disqualifies it from being used as shell code. Yeah, I need the address that's where it is. Yeah. It's, uh, so uh, eventually we will inject our shell code into like the simple login program or something like that. And this address, the simple login program, is not same as what it is in uh, the Hello World program, right? This address will probably be meaningless in the Hello World program. And that's because, of course, in x86 uh, protected mode, each process gets its own unique 32-bit address space. Okay, so uh, remote users, uh, remote guys, can one of you point out another issue with uh, using this as shell code? All right, I'll open it up to you guys in now. Got an exit function. The exit function is not a problem at this point. Um, there's something more obvious. The null the, uh, null character yeah, there's all kinds of nulls up in here. So if we were to, uh, oh. let's assume that we threw this at the, uh, the simple login program and tried to make it interpret this as our password attempt, it would say V8 OK, and 04 OK, 00 ups, end of the string, and it would only copy two bytes. And obviously, we need it to copy like 72 bytes for our exploit to be successful. So those are really the uh, the main issues. The exit thing isn't a problem because the exit one is actually a system call as well. And um, in this case, we're just going to get it to print a message and then exit. And that's just what we wanted to do. So it's no big deal. The main issues here are the absolute address. This address is bogus in any victim process address space. And all these null characters that we got to get rid of. So the easiest thing to do is to get rid of the null characters, actually. So I think that's what I do next. OK. Oops. Yes. Sorry. So um, for the next phase of the shell code, we're just going to try to get rid of the, uh, the null bytes that appear in the shell code, okay? Because um, that's kind of easier than dealing with the uh, absolute address at this point. So the reason we got all those null bytes is because we tried to move a value into a 32-bit uh, a register. So if you'll recall, in the last phase, this was something like move EAX4. And EAX is a 32-bit register. So when we try to move a value to it, the assembly automatically uh, wants to basically consume the, um, 
the whole 32 byte register, so it's going to head out the rest of zeros. Now, there's this cool thing you can do in x86 to uh, address subsets of the AX register, only other parts of it. So when I say move AL4, I mean don't set EAX to 4, just set the lowest um, byte of EAX to 4. Let me draw that on the board. This is a little bit tricky. Okay, so in x86 registers are 32 bits, right? Everyone's looking at the be there. So we have something like E A X. And we'll say these are EAX's um, 32 bits in their entirety. And let's break it up into um, it's four bytes, okay? Because uh, 32 bits is four bytes. Everyone's in there too, right? So um, x86 actually has a cool way where you can address individual parts of the register. So if you tell the assembler to use EAX, it's going to automatically assume the whole 32-bit register. If you tell the, uh, the assembler AX, it's an EAX, it's just going to address the, uh, the bottom two bytes, the lowest 16 bits. And if you were to say AL or AH, you'd be talking about this byte or that byte. Notice that you can't address these individually. That's just kind of a little bit You would have to use like a bitwise or arithmetic if you wanted to mess with these individually. So if I just wanted to um, set this to 1, you can just do move. A H one, and let's assume that this is like you know F F F F F F F F. The time that I execute this, um, the end result would be E A X equals F F F F zero one F. And then if you were to just, you know, look at AH individually, it would still just come out as one. You guys follow that? Remote users, are you okay with that? Sure. Okay, yeah, I mean, not too bad. I don't know if it's anything like that in ARM, but uh, that's just kind of a weird thing that um, x86 does. So, um, like I was saying, whenever you want to set EAX to a value, like with our Hello World shellcode, we want to do something like move EAX 4, because 4 is the number for the right system function. Um, it's going to automatically, since we're messing with a 32-bit register, it's going to pad this out to be like 00, 00, 00, 04. That way it can come Really even some the buffer. And that's where all these extra zeros are coming from. If instead we did move AL4, it knows that we're just addressing this one byte value, so it's not going to add all this extra zero byte padding. That's how we're going to get all bytes. Yeah, question? But how would you, I understand the need to avoid putting zeros up on this code, but yeah. how do you ensure that? Um, you know, the example you gave where everything else is FF yeah. and you need to have the value of 4, you need to ensure that they're all 0 yeah. in the other. Excellent question. Anyone have the answer to that? So what you should do first is zero out the entire register before you change um, AL to 4. So you want to make sure that EAX is equal to 0 before you set AL equal to 4. That way the whole value of EAX is 4. Yep. Is there a, but the problem with that is you put in zero, so you have to set FF for FF. Yeah, so, the oh, there's a question. How do we set EAX to zero without any null bytes? Mm. Yeah. Is it all less than that they would have one? You could do that, yeah. 
There's an easier way. XOR with itself. Yeah, XOR with itself. And the advantage there is that the XOR itself it only takes up two assembly, uh, two x86 bytes to represent the XOR opcode with itself. Whereas if you were to do, try to do like add, you know, or move FFFF and add, that would be many more opcode bytes. We're trying to keep our shell code small. So, so yeah, it's sort of a, uh, you guys already got that. So yeah, in this case, that's what I did, you know, move AL4, BL1. Um, in this case, the program is already uh, zeroing out those registers for us. Okay, they're kind of assumed to be zero when the program starts there. Uh, when we inject it into another process, we're actually going to have to manually zero them out first. But for now, we're just trying to get rid of those null bytes. So you can see if I change it to move AL4, BO04, compared to B8040000. And then the last little trick there is that, you know, how do you get the zero byte in there? It's just the, uh, the XOR with itself. Okay. So null bytes gone. Here's one limitation. Remember the two issues we had when trying to convert this to the shell code were uh, null bytes and that absolute address. So uh, next we have to try to deal with that absolute address. So the opposite of absolute address is like relative address, right? We have to find somewhere relative to us so we can uh, store this message string. So uh, one sort of data area we can always use that's relative to us is a stack. You now we can always just kind of add things that will to the stack. So um, that is how I got around that absolute address issue. I basically push the string onto the stack. So these uh, hex values I'm pushing basically represent the own message. So I'm pushing the string onto the stack. And then I can just use the stack pointer as a pointer to our message string instead of that absolute address. So that's a little tricky. Um, probably the trickiest part about this is just understanding the message and the way it's ordered. You can see that uh, oh, and I wrote out for my for my own benefit the way um, you know the hex code is associated with this. So own is equal to like four f seven seven six c six five blah 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 blah. And I can push it onto the stack in sort of a crazy way because these are represented like, you know, backwards in memory, and the stack is also like rolling down, so there's sort of a lot of real nasty stuff going on there. But at the end of the day, I want um, ESP to look like I want ESP to look like this. I like people always have the one that doesn't work. So stack going down ESP and then blah 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 and um, the only message is you know four F Seven, six, e, six, five, six. So basically, after I push those values onto the stack, I have my ESP register pointing at the new message. That way, I can use ESP, which isn't an absolute address; it's basically a relative address, as the um, the pointer for my message string. I understand the uh, the pushes there are a little bit confusing just because of the way I have to um, order the bytes to get the message in the correct order. But does everyone understand the general concept of pushing the string onto the stack and then using ESP as the uh, pointer? So at this point, when I was developing this class uh, about a year ago, um, I thought, okay, this just I should be done at this point. Um, this shell code should work. I don't have any absolute addresses. If I look at it with the OBJ dump, I see 
No null bytes, no absolute addresses, everything is relative, it's position independent, um, everything should be good, but it didn't work. And I spent like probably, I don't know, 30 minutes or something trying to debug it. And um, can anyone tell me why this still isn't good? What's the issue? There's a bad byte in there somewhere. I'll give you a hint. Can anyone recognize what the bad byte is? It's actually the uh, 0A character is the new line character. So what happens is when I add that in my message string, that 0A new line character, which basically is just the new line in my own message, the gets call that reads in our password intent, C is the new line character, and assumes that that means you press enter and are done entering in your string. So, um, that's another byte you have to avoid. So what I did was I just uh, changed the 0A character to another exclamation point. Yeah, kind of cheating. And another sort of um, nasty thing or sort of tricky thing that I did here was that I made the message exactly uh, divisible by four bytes. Okay, so it's eight. Eight bytes in total is the length of the string. It is a by four. The reason I did that is because you can only push four byte values on the stack. So it would have been a huge pain trying to uh, write a message that wasn't visible by four. Or it would have been one. Um, yeah. So I think what we can do actually, well, I just want to make sure this actually works. I put the final version of the shell code in hello4.asm. So you can kind of see what's going on there. And like Keith pointed out earlier, um, I went ahead and just export those registers out to be saved, zeroed out all those registers before I just start changing individual bytes of them. And so this is really nasty looking assembly uh, compared to our original Hello World program, but it should be good as shell code. So we can just verify that it still works, which is something you should generally do. Uh, and notice we don't get the new line in the message, right? This time is because I just change it to that exclamation mark. So it still works, and when we look at it with that obj dump command, obj dump as d for disassemble, you can see no null bytes, no absolute addresses, should be all good. So, if we were to put this in the password buffer and override the return address and point it back at the password buffer where this is located, we would actually end up executing this mini program that we just injected into the, uh, the vulnerable victim process. We just kind of cool. We've taken one program and basically turned it into another program by exploiting this vulnerability. Okay, so <coughs> actually, why have you guys actually? So that's um, I'm actually going to have you guys use that shell code just so you can get a feel for using a shell code that we know works and exploiting a program before I have you guys develop your own shell code and use it to exploit another program. So we're going to use that Hello World shell code that I just um, showed you to exploit the um, simple login program. So, um, to really use this shell code though, well, we can see this is the obj dump output. We have to sort of recreate these 
you know, these binary bytes and the password buffer. So remember how we create those addresses like the curl e print backslash x? We have to do that for these. That way we can just get curl to generate this uh, mini program for us on command. So I've actually provided you a nice little curl script to do that. So you can see basically I just took the output of that uh, OBJ dump command. You can see the, the opcode bytes here in the screen as well. So B001 is down here and then uh, 31db, 31db, 880. Because these are just x86 opcode bytes. So if the instruction pointer is pointing at these, it's going to know, know what to do with them. Because you know, programs know what these bytes mean. You know that this, okay, this means interrupt OX80. This means XOR, some register with itself, and so on. So I just took the output of all of this and just turned it into a Perl script to you know emit those bytes. And what we're going to do is have the simple login program instead of executing Go shell execute our hello world shell bit. So instead of spawning a shell or printing the wrong password, it's not actually going to print our message. And that's um, significant because we're causing it to execute our own mini program that we custom developed, which means we could, you know, gain we have arbitrary code execution because of this vulnerability and so on the program. So everyone understand what we're going to do, the strategy here. So I'm going to walk you through this process so um, you guys can do it on your own a little bit later. Does so everyone understand um, where this Perl script came from? how it represents the, uh, the off codes of the shell code. For both users, do you follow that as well? Just want to make sure, because I know that um, that part can be a little bit weird. Wouldn't it be useful to have like a Pro script that I know, that I know. Someone asks about that, about that like all the time. And um, yes, it would be. However, <laughs> At this stage in your exploit development career, the more suffering, the better. All right. Okay. So the more stuff you have to, I don't know how to say this to be mean, the more stuff you have to do by hand, instead of you know going to Metasploit to generate shellcode, doing shellcode yourself, the more you have to do by hand, the more you're going to learn. This is a guide to learning experience. It's all about learning. So. Yes, in, in reality, when I'm developing an exploit, I have some magic script where I use Metasploit to automatically generate my shell code on the fly. But if you really want to be good at this stuff, you have to know how to do all of it manually. Period. So, all right, so it looks like the remote users are still on board. So let's just talk about um, sort of draw on the board, how we're going to generate our payload file, what the stack's going to look like. Um, and then we're going to actually develop the exploit, exploit the simple login program. So, let's come back to the board over here. Back into stack land. So this is going to be the stack for right after the git's called, right after our password attempt has been in, inputted in again. I'm just going to show you what we want the stack to look like eventually. So essentially, we're going to have our shell code. So say like uh, x31. X C zero X three one. So just the bytes that I'm just copying down off the shell code we got here. Blah 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 blah. Um, the hello shell code is not 64 bytes total. Okay, that's only like 30 something bytes. We're going to need to completely consume the password buffer though. So we're going to have some like uh, some padding value in here. So you know this is all the shell code. We'll 
say this is 30 bytes. I'm guessing, I think it's actually something else, but it doesn't matter for now. 30 bytes, which means we would need like 34 more bytes of adding to completely consume that password buffer so we can get to the important process metadata, like the return address and the save frame pointer. So 30 bytes of this, so we'll say like a, 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 And then, so after that, we will completely have consumed the password buffer. We can just put these again for the save frame pointer. We don't care about it. And then, what will we put for the return address? Can anyone tell me what the return address will be? Approximately. We have shell code, padding. These for save frame pointer, and we need to write the return address. Previously, it was like 0804 blah blah AA, which was the address of Ghost Shell. This time, we want the return address to point back into the stack to where our password buffer is, because that's where our main program is. Okay. So this is going to look. The stack addresses are like BF, so equals F, F, question mark, question mark. We'll discover that later. Now, the payload I've described up there actually isn't optimal. And that's because in order for our execution to work, our um, return address would have to hit the first byte of that shell code exactly. If it hit anywhere else, like halfway in the shell code, it would probably crash. Because it has to execute everything precisely for that shell code to work. For instance, if we point at the EIP, you know, return address has to point right here exactly. Okay? If it ends up pointing right here, you know, all of a sudden, well, this would probably crash because it's inside the middle of an x86 instruction. And, and this would not be a valid x86 instruction because this instruction is supposed to technically supposed to start here. Or let's say it started right here, which is valid, but we've only executed half our shell code, so we didn't initially zero out the register to get a crash. So the whole shell code has to be executed starting at the first byte. So one thing we can do to uh, help ourselves out is using no ops. So a no-op instruction is a one-byte instruction that basically does nothing. And um, what this means is that if we were to make our payload something like We need 34 bytes of no ops. And then let's put S as for shell code because I keep forgetting what the opcodes are. And this is 30 bytes. which means these two together are 64 bytes. Which means we'll have no ops and then our shell code completely assuming the password buffer. 
and we're going to write four Bs to go write the frame pointer. And what this does for us is the return address can then point at this or this or this or any one of these 34 no offs and we'd be okay because we'd execute one, then the next, then the next, blah, 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 and then start executing our shell code. Doesn't matter which no op we start on because eventually we'll slide down the no ops, no ops slide is what they call it, until eventually we get to our shell code and we'll start executing our shell code in the first byte. So what this allows us to do is to have multiple valid return addresses that will cause our mini program, our shell code, to be executed. And this is critical in exploit development because um, you want to have a little wiggle room because often uh, you'll develop, for instance, an exploit for um, your system and you want it to work on someone else's system and their stack addresses will actually be a little bit different. So you want to have sort of like a lot of padding of valid addresses so that uh, there's greater reliability that your exploit will work because their system will be a little bit different than yours. Say they're running source stack 2 instead of source stack 3 or something like that. So having those extra no offs in there, this gives us more valid addresses we can return to and increases our odds of success. Everyone follow that? Remote users? Metric guys, you okay? There are some in the exploit community that would actually frown upon using no offs and stuff because they want everything to have surgical precision because it shows skill. And, um, you know, there's some argument to that, but when you're trying to develop an exploit that, uh, that works, you do what you got to do. Okay. So, um, some important points here from this slide, just to reiterate on, is that the no ops plus the shell code needs to be 64 bytes. Everyone understands why that is, right? Yep. To completely consume that buffer that we're overflowing, the password buffer. Four bytes of junk don't matter because we do not care about the state frame pointer at this point in the class. And then the address of the password buffer or the address of one of our no-ops in particular. Because if we can execute one of our no-ops, we'll eventually slide down to our shell code and be okay. So this is what our payload file is going to look like. It's going to cause a stack to look like what I drew on the board, and then hopefully our shell code will be executed. So let's go through the process of um, developing our shell code. Okay. So first I wanted to see my shell code in a file. For a second, but you can see that you know, just put these hexadecimal bytes into this file for us, and this file represents the end of the shell code. The next thing that we're going to want to do is figure out what the actual size of our shell code is. I guess that it was 30 on this, but I think it's something else actually. So um, you just do, oops, that's not right, sorry. WC shell code, it's like word count shell code, which just tell us the number of bytes in the shell code. So in this case, yeah, I actually uh, got it backwards. The shell code is, um, 34 bytes, not 30. So that means we need to have how many bytes of no ops in our payload? 30. And which should come first, the no ops or the shell code in our payload file? Shell code. The no ops. No. So we need um, let's go ahead and start constructing our payload file and no ops come first. 
is there going to be a, if you remember when I drew on the board what the password buffer looked like, the P in password was at the very bottom of the stack. And we want those no ops to be at the bottom of the stack. That way they get executed. The EIP keeps getting incremented and going up towards our actual shelter. And no op is hexadecimal nine zero. Nine zero. Does anyone know what no op actually does? So yes. It does an exchange. What register? Exchange what with what? E, with EAX, I think. Yeah, who was it that said that? Because I know you've taken DNS class if you know that. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we were at super nerd trivia trying to impress girls one night. Yeah, you know, we'll have wild success. So um, so yeah, we want to change EAX, EAX, which is basically nothing. So let's start constructing our payload file. First thing we want to do is print those no ops out first. And we want to print 64 is the size of the password buffer, 34 is the size of the shell code, so 35 is the total. Just make it explicit up that you can dig in there. Then, I use the, uh, the cat command just to put the contents of this file and append it to this one. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Linux, you might want to write that one down too. So at that point, that's what our um, payload file looks like, and at this point, it should be 64 bytes. Okay. So at this point, in our payload development, we're at the point where we will be overriding the save frame pointer. Okay. We don't care about that, so we're just going to tack on four bytes of junk. Now, what should the uh, the next value be in the payload? Addresses of no, so no offers. Yeah, return address into the new loss. Or if you wanted to be fancy, you could try to get the first item shell code too. Um, but what is that address? Nobody knows, okay. right? So over DST. Yeah, but where is DST? So what I want you guys to do. Is, uh, I'm not going to tell you how, but I'm going to see what a solution you can come up here with for a minute. And I use the debugger to try to find out what we should use as the return address for our payload. 